Well, hello, everybody. Um, welcome to Thursday, uh, January 27th's lecture. Um, this is going to be a busy one. Got a lot of things to cover today. Uh, so, oh, yeah, I need to enable transcription. Hold on. Enable transcription. Okay. So we've got uh, a lot of work to do today. We're going to be talking about uh, alkyl halides, halogens, um, organic uh, fluorines, chlorines, bromines, and iodines, the organohalides. Now, we're going to talk about that in the context of two things in your world that are important. So one of which is ozone depletion. Uh, I had mentioned that last class, uh, the ozone layer protecting us from ultraviolet radiation, right? So we don't get skin cancer. Um, that's very important. So we're gonna talk about that part of it. And then we're also gonna talk about organohalogens as they relate to anesthesia. And then finally, at the end of today's lecture, we're going to briefly uh, describe uh, what we're, where we're heading in terms of two particular reactions called elimination and substitution. Now, we're not going to do elimination and substitution today. If you look at our schedule, um, let me share my screen with you real quick. back. Share screen. Come over here. I don't my, it's giving me, but not my schedule. You don't see the schedule up there, do you? I don't know why that's not working. You can see it. You can see it. Oh, it is up? Oh, okay, good. Usually it gives me a green box around what I'm sharing, but for some reason, uh, it's not showing the green box. Okay, I'm glad you could see that. And this is from our Moodle page. You know where this is. Um, so right now, we're here at January 27th. And we're going to be talking about the alkyl halides. Now, first, we're going to talk about how do you make them? Well, we're just going to take uh, normal uh, hydrocarbons, not aromatics, by the way, just normal uh, saturated hydrocarbons like methane, ethane, propane, butane, not alkenes, not alkynes, not aromatics. These are just saturated uh, al uh, carbo, uh, carbon and hydrogen compounds that we are going to add, we're going to substitute a hydrogen for a halogen. And this particular reaction is known as free radical halogenation. And then we're going to see how that can make freons and how freons can lead to global warming. And we'll also talk about anesthesia and how that relates. But we're going to talk about that today. So I know this is for February 1st, but I think we can at least introduce it today. So we'll be able to get into that as well. And then um, later on, we'll get to substitution elimination. So basically, I think what we'll do is this is going to be substitution elimination will be a two-parter. So I'll change this. So on February the 1st, you can almost just put this piece also here. That'll be a two-parter because that, that's going to take a little bit more work. We got a little bit more work to do there. Okay, so let me stop that share real quick. And one thing that I promised you last class um, that related to something we did at the very end was about chirality because I had a lot of questions, both in office hours as well as people emailing me with this notion of chirality or handedness of molecules and how stereoisomers were different than constitutional isomers. So with that, I'll share my screen again and I will pull up um, the ChemSketch program and just draw a very, very simple molecule for you that is chiral. Okay, so let me go ahead and share my screen. ChemSketch. Okay, here we go. 
All right, so here is ChemSketch. And I'm gonna draw a molecule. Remember, um, this is a kind of chirality in which we call it a, a, a center of asymmetry, a center of asymmetry. There's another kind of chirality called helical chirality, where it's about a helical axis. So just to refresh your memory about what is asymmetry, anytime we, we put the, the letter uh, A in front of a word in organic chemistry, asymmetry means that that thing is without symmetry. So an asymmetric object is an object that does not have symmetry. Um, let's see, something in your world. Oh, let's, okay, so let me, let, let, let's talk about uh, baseball. A little bit early to be talking about baseball, but it's coming up, not too, not too far down the, the pipe here. So uh, if you are a, a baseball player and you're a batter, um, do you need to change your bat? Let's say you, you have the ability to switch hit. So I can, I can bat either from the left or right hand side. Do you need to change your bat in order to, to, to go lefty or righty? You don't, do you? I can use the same bat no matter which side of the plate I'm standing on. All right. So that baseball bat is what we call symmetric. It has symmetry. It doesn't matter what side of the plate I stand on. Now, let's talk about golf. Now, not a, not a putter. Let's talk about a, a driver or your five iron, okay? Golf clubs do come in handed forms, don't they? So if I was to try to borrow my friend's lefty five iron, I wouldn't be able to hit it, at least not with any any kind of power or anything, um, because that five iron, that lefty five iron won't work for a right-handed golfer. And I, I, I golf right-handed. So a golf club is asymmetric, right? It has no symmetry. So therefore you have to, you know, a left-handed player has to play with left-handed clubs and a right-handed player has to play with right-handed clubs. So there's a, an example of a kind of asymmetry and symmetry in, in your macroscopic world. Now let's talk about the molecular world for a minute. Let's talk about the world of a very, very small. So let me draw a very simple molecule that has a molecule that has four different objects on it. So I took a carbon, I put it in the middle. Let's put four things around it. So one, two, three, four. Now I just put four methyl groups in it, but that's okay, because I'm gonna change these in a minute. So let's put a fluorine atom in place of this carbon. So I click on the fluorine, then I come over here, and I just click on that atom that I want to change to fluorine. Then let's, uh, what else do we want to do? Let's choose a different atom here. Let's choose, no, not anything. Let's go chlorine. So do you see this little, let me, let me go back here. Okay, you see this, this submenu here that has the little dot, dot, dot and the thing. So I can come over here and I can choose some other atoms. I'm gonna choose a chlorine right now. Then, so I'm gonna make this carbon atom a chlorine, All right? Now go next to this chevron and come to the right and say, show buttons. Let's choose, uh, so we've got a fluorine, a chlorine. How about a bromine? Let's put a bromine on there. chose chlorine. I think I chose the wrong one. Go down here. Bromine. Bromine. Okay, there we go. Now I've got a, a carbon atom that has four different objects around it. I've got a chlorine, a fluorine, a bromine, and this methyl group here. Okay. So 
This center right here, that carbon atom in the middle, since it has four different objects on it, has now become chiral. And when I did that, this button up here became active. This is the stereochemistry button here. Um, in stereochemistry, we call things R and S, not left or right. In, in, in chemistry, the, the asymmetric carbon, that carbon that has the four different objects, we're gonna call the two hands, these are, by the way, another term that we'll learn later on, the two different enantiomers. We're gonna call these two different enantiomers R and S. Now, what does R and S stand for? R stands for rectus, uh, you know, to the right. S stands for sinister, to the left. So you learn some Latin phrases here, rectus and sinister. Um, don't worry about it. I'll never ask you to designate anything R and S. I just want to show you uh, some basic uh, stereochemistry here. So right now I can go ahead and, and let's, let's clean this up first. So let's come up here to tools and clean my structure. Now, if I rotate this around, if I try to, um, let's say, let's see, come on to US, three, select rotate. So I'm gonna rotate around this carbon atom. Do you see how it all looks very flat? Um, let me rotate in three dimensions here. See how it all looks flat? because we haven't optimized this structure in three dimensions. So right now, it looks like all of those bond angles are 90 degrees, doesn't it? But we know that that's not true. Those angles, that tetrahedron is 109. Now you just drew it. The computer program will allow you to draw anything, but that's not the reality of it. So if I come up here to my tools and I do 3D, structure optimization, then it's going to apply that to my molecule, the three dimensionality of it. Now you see the molecule in three dimensions. So if I rotate this around now, you see, and it's sometimes hard to tell, but you see how all of those are tetrahedral angles now? There you go. All right. So I've got two carbon atoms, one that's chiral. This one is chiral. But that carbon atom is not chiral because it has H, 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 and then this whole thing. Remember, a carbon atom has to have four different objects around it to be chiral. Three of these are the same, so it cannot be chiral. Now, we're going to go ahead and select RS right now and hover it over this carbon. See how it doesn't, it won't change it? The computer program is smart enough to know that that carbon atom is not chiral. Now, let me go ahead and while I got that highlighted, let me slide that over to that carbon atom. Watch what happens when I click that R designation. Let's turn that carbon atom into the stereoisomer that is rectus. Yes, you can. R and S. Let me go back. Let me come over here. Computer's giving me an error that shouldn't be there. Let me go ahead and rotate this around a little bit to make sure I've, I see everything properly here. No, that's not what I want to do. I want to just rotate. Actually, what I also want to do is control. I want to copy this diagram too before I leave that. Let, let me lasso this and copy it before I do anything. Copy. Paste. Structure. Put it right here. Okay. Now, RS. Not sure why it's telling me I can't do that. Coin floor. Well, at any rate, um, actually, what I'm going to do too to make this even simpler, I'm going to change this methyl group to a hydrogen atom. Huh. Program is definitely not behaving 
properly right now. But at any rate, this is a carbon atom. This is a carbon atom. And I'm going to, you know what I forgot to do is tools, clean structure, tools, 3D structure. Ah, yes. Okay, 3D optimization. There we go. Maybe I have to actually change the bond type. It's still not letting me do it. At any rate, I'll figure that out. Um, but normally you're able to designate these things as R and S and, and that works pretty well. So let me just look at that carbon atom and let's dissect it. It has these four different groups, a methyl, chlorine, bromine, and a fluorine on that carbon. So we know it's chiral. It comes in two forms, but it's not like it's a configurational isomer. Remember what configurational isomers were? They had the same chemical formula, but the, the bond connectivity was different. But there is no difference in the bond connectivity here and here. They're all connected the same way. That carbon atom, is connected to a chlorine, a bromine, a fluorine, and a methyl. This carbon atom here, a chlorine, a bromine, a fluorine, and a methyl. So the connectivities are all the same. Yet, when I take this, change that, and that, I have two different isomers here, two different stereo isomers one being R and the other one being S. Now, that's a lot to take in. I have no, I, I definitely know that you, you cannot understand even probably a 10th of what I just said when it comes to stereochemistry. It's one of the more difficult topics, even for students who are studying chemistry. So I won't belabor the point too much, but I need you to know that thus far, we have two different kinds of isomers, configurational and stereo, and they mean something very, very different. And they will have vast implications when we get to uh, drug design. All right, so I'll stop that share. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually, that's the, I'm not gonna use this program anymore today, so I'm gonna close this program out. All right. Now, now I want to get into the meat of the lecture. I want to talk about free radical halogenation. So let's go ahead and I'll bring up my notebook paper and let's go through all the steps to convert an alkane to an alkyl halide. And we'll do the simplest one to start with. We'll take methane and we'll, we'll, we'll take off a hydrogen atom and in place of the hydrogen, we're going to put a bromine atom in place of the hydrogen. All right, how do we do that? Let me share my screen with you again. Bring up my notebook. Okay. And get my Apple pencil here real quick. All right. Free radical halogenation. Here we go. So here's methane right here. And we're going to take bromine, Br2. Bromine's a liquid. And we're going to combine the two. And now we need something else. This little thing that looks like an H and a V, that, that is actually H nu. This is the energy of a photon. That's Planck's number. So whenever you see these two little letters here, basically what I'm telling you is that is light. Now, another way to do this is by using peroxides. That's another way I can generate these radicals because that's what I need here. Before I get too far into that, so this is gonna make methyl bromide. Some of you people in turf grass or agriculture uh, know methyl bromide very well. It used to be used widely as a fumigant uh, to treat the soil before planting. 
to get rid of the pests that would hurt your peanuts or hurt your crop. Um, but because methyl bromide can get up into the atmosphere and destroy ozone, we'll see that later, methyl bromide is actually outlawed now. You can't use it on crops as a pesticide, as a, as a fumigant. Um, it has a lot of agricultural uses. It's also used in a lot of synthesis chemistry. All right, now, before I leave this slide, I want to talk about this bromine-bromine bond here for a second. This bromine-bromine bond is very weak. And let me expand this table for a minute. Let's find bromine and bromine. Here's dibromine, Br2. 193 kilojoules per mole is how much energy it requires to break that bromine-bromine bond. Look at all the other groups in this table. So if you go to carbon and hydrogen, way out here, pretty, or that's nitrogen-hydrogen, I'm sorry. Nitrogen-hydrogen. Um, Pretty strong, right? 391, uh, 201, 272. So in terms of the halogens, bromine is one of the weakest at 193. Uh, fluorine is even weaker at 155, but we'll talk about that later. Sometimes fluorine uh, gets its own kind of category, basically because these atoms are so small, they're, they're pretty tiny. Um, iodine is even weaker. Iodine is the weakest of the halogen, I2, at 151. But basically what I'm trying to tell you is that that bromine-bromine bond is weak. And what are the two reasons to make it so weak? Well, the first reason is these two atoms are very large. And because of that, this bond distance is very long. So long bonds, Single, I'm sorry, single long bonds usually mean weakness. The iodine-iodine bond is so long because these iodine atoms are so big that that bond is really weak. And that goes against the fluorine-fluorine bond. So if you just said that the bigger atoms make the weaker bond, doesn't that kind of kill my argument with fluorine? Since these are the smallest, that should be the strongest bond but it's not, isn't it? So here's the second thing to consider in terms of bond distance and bond strength. And that is when two atoms get very, very close to each other, fluorine and fluorine are very tiny. So their distance between them gets smaller and therefore we get a lot of repulsion. Remember, like charges repel. And the two nuclei of fluorine are both positive, right? So as you try to squeeze these two positive nuclei closer and closer, they begin to repel. So that's the anomaly with fluorine. Now, chlorine, bromine, iodine, they follow the trend very nicely. Chlorine being the strongest, because that's the shortest. Bromine next, and iodine the weakest. So let's just kind of put the F2 molecule off to the side for the moment. It doesn't follow the dihalogens. Now, the other thing to consider, let me show you this, multiple bonds. So the more bonds between two atoms, the stronger they are. So if I come up here, Look at carbon-carbon single bond versus carbon-carbon double bond. See those two? A carbon-carbon single bond is 300, roughly 350 kilojoules per mole to break. But look at the double bond, 614 kilojoules per mole. 
much, much, much stronger. So a carbon-carbon double bond is shorter and stronger than a carbon-carbon single bond. Even greater, come down one more. Look at a carbon-carbon triple bond, alkynes. Even stronger still at 840 approximately kilojoules per mole to break a carbon-carbon triple bond. Now, these are all approximate bond energies, by the way. See over here, average, average bond energies. So even still, you look at this 413 here, that's an average carbon-hydrogen bond strength. But even within simple single carbon hydrogen, say like in propane, butane, cyclohexane, all of those carbon hydrogens are going to be slightly different. They're not all going to be the same. But what your author has done is she took all of the carbon hydrogens of alkanes and she averaged them out. So this is just approximation. It's not perfect, but it works pretty well. All right, now that you know that, let me make that small again. And now let's talk about this reaction up here, the halogenation of methane to make methyl bromide. Let me go to my next page and let's do it. So all radical reactions have these three steps. And, and by the way, it's not just free radical halogenation, it's many other free radical reactions. We'll learn later on how free radical polymerization also has these three steps. So step one, initiation. We have to make radicals to start with. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to use the fact that the bromine-bromine bond is very weak. These are lone pairs, right, that I'm drawing for you right now? See those three bars around bromine? Lone pairs. This bond in the middle, bonding pair, or just a chemical bond. All right, so just some more vocabulary. Let's get rid of that because I need, I need a clean, clean space here. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to take this molecule, and we're going to shine light. Oh, I didn't. I don't want. I don't want blue. Get rid of that. I want black. Let's shine light, light of a particular frequency. It's gonna cause the bromine-bromine bond to vibrate and fracture, break. This is called homolytic cleavage. We're gonna learn later on, there's another kind of bond cleavage called heterolytic. But homolytic means of this chemical bond here, remember, all, every time I drew a line, and it doesn't matter if it was a lone pair or bonding pair. Each line is two electrons. So one of these electrons is going to go on this bromine. The other electron is going to go on that one. We just fractured it. And notice it's a single fish hook arrow, not a double. The double means I'm moving a pair of electrons. When you only see that single barb at the end of your fish hook, that means it's one electron. So what that just means is I just made two bromine radicals. Okay. That is initiation. We initiated the radical. All right. Step number two, propagation. Remember, it's not just for this one, but it's for any radical reaction. 
propagate, to propagate. You know, in, in agriculture, if you're propagating things, you, you take a plant and you make some new plants from the old plants, right? So we're going to do the same thing here. We're going to propagate a radical and make a new radical. All right, so how are we going to do that? So we're going to take methane. Here's methane. And we're going to use one of those radicals that we just made, one of those bromine radicals. And we're going to make a new radical. We're going to make a carbon radical from the bromine radical. Again, single fish hook. Single fish hook. Single fish hook. So now that just made, oh, let me get an eraser here, a new system. Uh, let me move that over just a little bit. Uh, I need a little bit more space here. All right, here's my bromine radical. Single fish hook, single fish hook. Single fish hook is going to the carbon here. And then we, we just made a new group, a new carbon radical. There it is. So that's this piece. One of those two electrons in that bond went to the carbon. And the other thing we just made is a new covalent bond, didn't we? Plus HBr. How did that form? Formed from here. Okay, so that's propagation. We turned the bromine radical into a carbon radical. Now, let last step, termination. Step three. Termination. So we're gonna take that methyl radical that we just made, Do you remember back up in the first step in step number one, initiation? Didn't we form two bromine radicals? Well, we've only used up one of them. We still have one left over. And we're going to add that bromine radical to the methyl radical. They're going to combine and make a new covalent bond. And you just made methyl bromide by adding bromine liquid, Br2 liquid, with methane and some light, you made methyl bromide. Now let's dissect that for a second, methyl bromide. Let's look at some of the physical properties of methyl bromide. What do you think? Do you think it's polar? I think it is. I think you already knew that because bromine, if, I, if you had a table of electronegativities, Bromine is much more electronegative than carbon. So there is a bond dipole going from the carbon to the bromine. And therefore, that is going to induce, that is going to create a molecular dipole in the molecule in which the carbon atom is delta plus and the bromine atom is delta minus partial. Remember that squiggly S means delta, delta, lowercase delta, partial plus, partial minus. So methyl bromide is polar, one end of the molecule positive, the under the end of the molecule negative. 
So this molecule is sticky and it, it's a low boiling liquid at room temperature, okay? But it does evaporate pretty quickly. So when a farmer, well, not anymore, not anymore. But when a farmer used to put methyl bromide in the field, inject it into the soil to kill all those pests before she planted her crop, uh, then that stuff will eventually leak out into the air and then go into the atmosphere. And what is the, the downfall of that? Well, that's the topic of my next slide. So now you know uh, radical, plum, uh, radical free radical halogenation. Now, let's talk about what happens when we make these radicals. So at the top, I have ozone. O3, and I have a chlorine radical, in this case, a chlorine radical. It came from Freon, okay? We'll talk about Freon in a minute when we expand that picture down below. So that radical, that chlorine radical here, right here, is a free radical, and it reacts with ozone. And it's gonna make chlorine monoxide Chlorine monoxide itself is a radical. So one could think of this as, pro, as another propagation step. So the first propagation step was the freon that caused the, the chlorine radical to be made. So I don't show that step. That's prior to this one. So the initiation phase to make this thing came from light and freon. Or in the case of methyl bromide, methyl bromide with light would make a bromine radical. It would work identically. So it fractures the ozone to make molecular oxygen. Molecular oxygen does not absorb the bad UVB rays. We'll talk about the difference in these two UVs in a second. Now, the chlorine monoxide then reacts with oxygen radicals in the atmosphere to create molecular oxygen and Look what happened. The chlorine radical just perpetuated itself. You see here, chlorine radical, chlorine monoxide, back to chlorine radical, which could then destroy another ozone particle. So conceivably, one freon molecule could destroy tens of thousands of ozone particles. So it doesn't take much freon to destroy a whole lot of ozone, which is what was happening, which is why a lot of those early freons now are against the law. You can't use them anymore because they were causing ozone depletion and melanomas here on earth. Now, once you, these oxygen radicals react with ozone, oxygen radicals themselves can cause the destruction of ozone to make molecular oxygen, okay? So here is the sad story of our history of using uh, freons uh, for refrigeration. Now, I'm gonna expand my picture here a little bit so you could see it better. CFC, that stands for chlorofluorohydrocarbon. In this case, this particular one is trichlorofluoromethane, okay? Now, when light, when, these, when this light hits this molecule, it fractures the carbon-chlorine bond, creating chlorine radicals. What, I, what my arrow is sitting right here is a chlorine radical. Here's the ozone particle. So here's this, this next reaction. So here is initiation. Initiation is step one. Propagation, oxygen rat or chlorine radical reacting with ozone in this propagation step to make chlorine monoxide and molecular oxygen. Then I, again, then this thing goes on in more steps to form oxygen, more chlorine radical, and another ozone particle is depleted. Uh, so that's the ultimately the devastating uh, step. So 
chlorofluorohydrocarbons, hydrochlorofluorocarbons. These were aerosols. I think I told you about that last time where, uh, you know, things that are in aerosol cans, PAM spray, they don't use that anymore. They used to. Uh, deodorants, um, hairspray, all of these propellants, uh, these uh, consumer products used to use these gases to propel the liquid out of the, the can, but no longer. Th those are outlawed. We already talked about refrigerants, but they're also used as solvents. Many of these things are solvents. Uh, halons and fire extinguishers, those are also uh, bad for the environment. And then, uh, of course, methyl bromide, we just talked about that. Uh, pesticides, uh, fungicides, uh, nemocides, many, 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 many uses of methyl bromide in agriculture. Fortunately, they've been replaced. All right, so the UV spectrum has a couple of different uh, uh, layers. The UVB rays, notice here, this is, they're, they're impinging this outer layer, the stratosphere. Here's the troposphere, the one that's closest to us. So this is from zero to 10 kilometers above the earth, the troposphere. Then outside of 10 kilometers going out to be, and it's kind of hard, this is fuzzy out here, but let's say 10 to 50 uh, kilometers above the earth is the stratosphere. This is where the ozone is. The UVB rays, they come down and the ozone protects us, they shield us. Look at how diminished the UVB uh, rays are. So when they get to the earth, they're far less damaging. Now still some gets through. So you shouldn't go out there, uh, go down to Wrightsville Beach this summer and, and coat yourself with baby oil and, and get yourself a nice tan. That's what my sisters used to do. Well, oh, not in Wrightsville, but up in New York. Uh, very bad for your skin. You can still get some of that UV rays to hurt, you, hurt yourself. And then your skin gets ugly, it gets wrinkly. Uh, hopefully you won't get skin cancer. Okay, so that is the story of free radical halogenation and how it applies to a destructive thing called uh, uh, ozone depletion. Let's talk about a different uh, radical, halogenated radical in which we can form anesthesia compounds. Uh, these are ga the gaseous ones, by the way. There's lots of different kinds of anesthesia, by the way. Uh, I think you know that. You know, you've got those injectable compounds, you know, uh, propofol, remember, remember Michael Jackson, you know, when he died, you know, he had a lot of propofol in his system. Um, that's what the, you know, a lot of times they give you uh, when you get a colonoscopy or other, it's a short-lived, anesthesia that they inject into you. Um, and, and the nice thing is, is you, don't, you don't get stomach sick from that one. Then you got uh, you know, other kinds of anesthesia uh, like spinal blocks. Um, many times women that go in to have a baby uh, in order to mitigate the pain of childbirth, uh, an anesthesiologist will inject into the woman's uh, spine uh, some anesthesia that will block the nerve endings there. Um, but these anesthetics that I'm talking about right now are gases. So let me expand this for a second and talk about some general anesthesia uh, materials. These are the ones where you put the mask over the patient's face. You ask them to breathe in, count down from 10, uh, I've never gotten past eight before I'm out. Most people can't ever get to five. Very fast acting. And we have all these different general anesthesia compounds. So this one over here, chloroform, very old. It works. Um, if you ever get a chance to see, it's a very good film. It's called Cider House Rules where a physician, uh, a doctor, takes care of a lot of boys in the cider house, they're, they're orphans, he runs this orphanage. And unfortunately, the doctor is under a lot of stress. And so what he ends up doing 
is he puts a lot of chloroform, which is a liquid, in, in a little cotton ball and he puts it in a, a vaporizer and he inhales the chloroform so he can go to sleep at night. Um, I won't destroy the ending for you, but okay. Hopefully you'll go see Cider House Rules and you'll see chloroform. Now, in the old days, they used to use diethyl ether. You're going to use this in lab, by the way, diethyl ether. Um, ethyl, CH3, CH2, right? Two carbons, ethyl. There's an uh, a eth ethane fragment to the left, an ethane fragment to the right. And what makes this an ether, ether, is R-O-R. -R. So this could have been methyl, ethyl, uh, phenyl, methyl, doesn't matter. These R groups could be variable. But when you ever have an oxygen in the middle of those two R groups, we call those ethers. They're not alcohols. Remember, that would be an ROH. They're very different molecules. But diethyl ether was widely used in anesthesia, but it had a bad prop, it had two, two bad properties. First off, diethyl ether made patients very sick after they woke, stomach sick, after they woke up. So that was one bad problem. The other bad problem is diethyl ether is extraordinarily flammable. So many operating theaters would catch fire when a physician would drop an instrument or, I know this sounds crazy, but way back in the old days, when you know they didn't know about the dangers of smoking, a lot of surgeons would actually smoke in the operating theater. And unfortunately, they catch their themselves and their patients and their techs all on fire. So diethyl ether isn't used anymore as an anesthesia agent. But these others are fluoroxane. This one has an alkene. Kind of looks like diethyl ether, doesn't it? So we got two carbons to the left, two carbons to the right. But this one's an ether, and this one contains halogens trifluorohalogens, fluoroxine. This next one, halothane, just looks like ethane, but it has chlorine, bromine, and these three fluorines on it. Very effective. We have methoxyfluorane. So here's where we have these uh, OCH3 groups. That's a methoxy group, CH3O. Okay, and isofluorane, uh, enfluorane, desfluorane, sevofluorane. W why so many? Why so many different halogenated hydrocarbons and a lot of them being ethers? Some of them, some of them being ethers. This is an ether with carbon fluorines. This is not an ether. Halothane is not an ether. It's just a fluoro uh, hydrocarbon. But they all put you to sleep. Now, I'm not gonna go into the biology of um, anesthesia and how it works, but all I will say is that these different molecules have different lifetimes. So how long do you need to put the patient out? That's one of the things that's important in a procedure. Uh, do you just need to knock them out briefly? Do you just need to just uh, put them into a twilight stage instead of a deep sleep? So something like, um, there's an anesthesia that I don't show you up here. Uh, let me go ahead and get a pencil here. N2O, oh, that's a very big, let me erase that. That's awfully large. Let me get a thinner, thinner pencil line here. That's another uh, inhaled gas, nitrous oxide. We talked about that with cars, right? The, the, the fast and the furious, inject that into the cylinders, you get a lot of power. But if you go to the dentist's office and you take a woof of nitrous, uh, you will kind of feel very good and you'll kind of go into this twilight stage and the dentist can pull out your tooth and you're still kind of awake. It's kind of a weird anesthesia. You're awake, but you don't remember anything. 
you don't really feel much. So it's a nice uh, way that you can uh, extract a tooth or uh, some people are just even nervous about getting a cavity filled and that and the doc will give you, uh, she'll give you a little whiff of nitrous just to kind of take the edge off and, and then do the procedure. So that's another gas. All of those are gases. Now, ethanol is not a gas, but ethanol down there used to be used uh, in surgeries before they had all these other compounds. So back in the Civil War, before a surgeon would amputate your limb, they would get you to drink a half a bottle of whiskey to kind of knock you out. Obviously not the best anesthesia there, but what would you rather? Would you rather be fully awake and somebody sawing off your gangrenous limb? That, that's kind of gross. Let's, let's get on to something else here. Okay, so, but again, all of these things have carbon fluorine bonds. They're all very polar, right? Why are they polar? Because they have a net non-zero dipole moment. Fluorine, very electronegative, pulling out. Fluorine, very electronegative. So these things do have a good sense of polarity and they'll, they'll dissolve in some of your tissues to some degree or another. Now these elemental noble gases, can you put somebody out with helium, argon and xenon? Oh yeah, you can but you better be giving them some oxygen along with that helium or argon or xenon. Because if you try to knock somebody out with pure helium, you will kill them, right? Helium does not support the transport of oxygen through your cells. So you'll very quickly asphyxiate uh, the person if you just gave them pure argon or xenon or helium. If you're a diver, some of these gases are part of uh, what they call trimix. Uh, when, when divers go very, very deep in the ocean, they'll use mixtures of oxygen and helium and helium and, and argon. And so that allows uh, scuba divers to go very, very deep for longer periods and then come up without having headaches because of nitrogen in their blood. Uh, which could be very dangerous. All right, so continuing on, let me stop that share. And let's keep going. Oh. And talk about the final, oh, I didn't wanna, didn't wanna stop that. Hold on a second, let me bring that back up again. Share my screen. Okay. All right. So yeah, that's all I had to do. I had, had to say about anesthesia. Um, people in operating theaters, by the way, they have to be kind of careful because, you know, best laid plans, you, you try to keep all that anesthesia going to the patient. But, you know, if you're running, you know, you're in a, a, a particular operating theater, you're running several operations a day, you know, you can, you can kind of anesthesia yourself. So you gotta be careful if you're ever working in a hospital around a lot of anesthesia. All right, now let's go for a preview. Because organohalides for us, yes, the organohalides are dangerous for, for the atmosphere, for ozone depletion. Organohalides are useful compounds for anesthesia. And organohalides are very useful as substrates for two very important reactions that I'll just kind of briefly mention right now. But in, in Tuesday's, next Tuesday's class, we're gonna spend a lot more time on these reactions. Organohalides are substrates for elimination reactions and for substitution reactions. All right. So remember that list of reactions that I told you to start uh, writing in the back of your notebook? So the first one, the first uh, broad organic reaction that we learned was oxidation, right? So that was number one. I hope you got it on your list. If you don't, get yourself a piece of notebook paper. You need to know all these reaction types. 
oxidation. Now, the particular oxidation that we talked about uh, way back at the start of class was combustion. Combustion is one type of oxidation. We're gonna talk about a lot more later on, but for right now, you only know oxidation. Now, the opposite of oxidation was reduction. And we talked about reducing reagents. The particular one we talked about was hydrogenation, H2, adding to molecules. Where did we see that previously? Well, we saw it when we talked about the early atmosphere of our Earth, right? The Yuri Miller experiment put hydrogen gas mixed in with methane and water vapor and ammonia. And it, and it blasted it with a big burst of energy from an arc and it made amino acids. So that reaction where you had hydrogen gas is known as a reduction. It's the opposite of oxidation, right? So there's reaction number two in your list of organic reactions, oxidations and, hydro and reductions. Now, uh, that hydrogenation, by the way, is just one type of reducing reagent. There are many, many, many others. And we'll learn a couple more before the end of the semester, all right? Then the third reaction we just learned today, correct? Free radical halogenation. So that is uh, uh, free radical reactions. Free radical halogenations is one type of free radical reaction. So the broad category is free radicals. And we're gonna talk about, the, the, the other big one we're gonna talk about later on is free radical polymerization to make plastics, not today. For, for later on. So free radical reactions, free radical halogenations is one part of free radical organic reactions. That's your number three. Number four is elimination reactions. And this is one type that I'm gonna show you up here. And then the, the other type is called substitution reactions, which is on the bottom. So let me just sketch this Free rat or not free rat, this elimination reaction first. So the first one up here is called an elimination reaction. You need an organohalide. See, everything kind of builds on itself in organic chemistry. So we know that we can make this from pro, uh, cyclopentane, right? This is the cyclopentane molecule, right? Five carbons, one, two, three, four, five five carbons in a ring, cyclopentane. Now, one thing that you should note is that if you ever uh, build this with your chem sketch molecule, you notice there's two faces. Whenever you build a ring, like any ring, there are two faces to the ring, a top face and a bottom face. That's why I have put this sort of bromine up and the hydrogen is down because this bromine is on the top face of the cyclopentane the hydrogen is on the bottom face, okay? So this is bromocyclopentane, okay? Now, if you were to take a base, something, let's say, uh, sodium hydroxide, negative charge, it can pull off a hydrogen adjacent to this bromine group. This is called the leaving group, by the way, leaving group. Let me... Let me put that down for you. Leaving group is the bromine. I need a thicker pencil here a second. Hold on a second. So the BR minus is the leaving group. Now, in doing so, that created a new double bond between that bro where what used to be the bromine and the hydrogen. So this pair of electrons right here fell down and kicked off the Br to make Br minus bromide. 
as the leaving group. That's called an elimination reaction. This is one type of elimination, by the way. This particular elimination is called an E2 elimination, or sometimes people call it a beta elimination. But again, that's not for today. That's for Tuesday, because I'm just going to set the stage for you so that this weekend, I hope you you get on to the my reading list there, get on the the Moodle page that, or get on your schedule and look at those readings and read about eliminations and substitutions. Now, let's talk about the second reaction, substitution. So that's the one at the bottom. So I have this thing, nuke. N-U-C, I abbreviate it. Nuke means nucleophile. I want to show you, look, look at this right here. The base up here that I used is something that had a negative charge, negative one charge. Look at here, a nucleophile also has something that has a negative charge. Well, why didn't that thing nuke do the elimination reaction to make the alkene? Well, here's the thing about nucleophiles. Nucleophiles like to attack semi-positive carbons. Now, why is that carbon atom semi-positive? You know that answer. We have just talked about this. That carbon-bromine bond is very polarized. There is a bond vector going towards the bromine, making that carbon atom delta positive, the bromine delta negative. So remember, opposites attract. So my nucleophile being negative attacks the electropositive carbon. Now carbon can only have four bonds. So somebody's gotta go. And in this case, the bromine is the atom that, that leaves. It's the weakest bond. It is the leaving group. One example of a great nucleophile is iodide. I minus. Iodide is a very good nucleophile, but it is a terrible base. How did I know that? I know something about acid base chemistry. And on Tuesday, we're going to discuss how you can recognize something that's a good nucleophile, but a terrible base, and vice versa. We'll talk about good bases that are awful nucleophiles, even though they both contain a negative one charge. But there are certain attributes about these negative one things that lead them to either be nucleophilic, leading to substitution, versus elimination, leading to the formation of carbon-carbon double bonds. So over here, the bromine has been replaced by the nucleophile. Very good reaction. And it's used widely in organic synthesis. Okay, so I will stop that share real quick here. And let's see, we have about 10, 15 minutes left. So if anybody has any questions, either about today's lecture or previous lecture, um, before I get too far into it, I've had a lot of people starting to get concerned about exams. What's gonna be on the exam? What are the exams like? Is it gonna be multiple choice? Is it gonna be computational? Is it gonna be... As My best advice for what is an exam gonna be like, it's gonna be exactly like your homework, okay? It's gonna be the same kind of questions. There'll be some multiple choice. There'll be some true false. There'll be some, okay, give me a number. So is it two, is it five, is it seven? Uh, there'll be short answers, uh, uh, isotopes, uh, anion, cation. You might have to write a word as your answer. There might be a short essay. And, and by the way, uh, just like, so for the homework, 
you know, you, you, can, you can write a little bit more, which is fine. On the exams, uh, I would like you to be a little bit more on the succinct side. Answer the question in the fewest words possible, but still hitting all the points because, um, you know, people have to read these. Me and the graders have to read these. And sometimes, you know, if you're going to write a book, ugh, boy, that's a lot of work. Now, I'm not going to discount you, but, but yeah. So do I give practice exams? I do not give practice exams. First off, I don't have any because I'm teaching this course a whole different way this semester. I don't, so if I gave you a practice exam, it, wouldn't look, it would look nothing like the real exam. And then everybody gets upset. Oh, you gave me a practice exam, didn't look anything like the, the real exam. And then everybody's unhappy. So basically the exams are just like the homework. So it's basically just content driven homework. Yeah, there'll be a lot of multiple choice. As you saw in the homework, great deal of multiple choice, wasn't it? Yeah, there was some questions you had to answer with a number or a word. And, and those, will be, those will be the dominant kind of questions, a word, a number, or multiple choice. Occasionally I give true false. Um, I don't usually like the true falses as much because then it, a lot of times people are just flipping a coin, right? You just, uh, oh, uh, I don't know, I'll just guess true. Well, you got a 50-50 chance there. Eh. You, you don't want tests to be just random guessing. So I, I may give one or two multiple uh, true falses, but, but no more than that on any exam. Okay, so just a little sidebar because a lot of people have been asking about the test. Um, so now the test isn't for a few weeks, so we don't have a test next week, by the way. Uh, I will keep an eye on the COVID situation. Like last week, I was very hopeful we could get together in person this week, but the numbers just didn't work out. So I will again send out a notice this weekend, you know, whether or not we'll get we'll gather together, uh, which I'm hopeful uh, on next Tuesday uh, for our first formal face-to-face -face lecture, because I would like to see some of you. Uh, I, I don't like teaching this way, but you know, we just got to do what we got to do to stay safe. Okay, so all that, uh, I will leave it open. If you have any questions, I have to turn up my speaker a little bit here. If you have any questions, just uh, unmute yourself and let me know what you are thinking about, whether it's chemistry or others. Anybody okay? Hey, Dr. Brown, I have a question. Let it, let it, let it fly. Um, I sent you an email about it and um, I wasn't expecting you to get back to me already or anything. I just figured I would mention it just because sure. I'm here. On yeah, 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 please, please, absolutely. Go ahead. Um, so my student ID is not right. in the Kahoot um, roster. Oh, did you add late? Yes. I okay, figured that was okay. probably the reason. That's I'm sure I know that's the reason. Okay. So uh, if you did add late, um, so uh, Matthew, I'm going to go ahead right now after we sign off and I'm going to bring up my list. I'm, I'm going to assign you a Kahoot number uh, based upon where you fall in the alphabet. So I will send that to you in, in, in a private email. Uh, and just so expect that in about an hour. Got it. Thank you. Hey, Matt. Anybody else? I just um, had a quick question. Oh, sorry. Sure. No, go ahead, Caitlin. Oh, thank you. Um, so I know that you said that we don't do like practice exams or anything like that, but I know on our schedule, it says that we'll have a review day. Is right. that kind review. of going to be like a study guide of like going over the concepts that we should really focus on? Well, that that's one. Yeah, yeah you're right. That's one. That's one thing. So mm -hmm. definitely come to the uh, review sessions because those are helpful because I kind of bring everything together uh, so that we, we, we see the big picture stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, but the other thing that you should keep an eye out for, you know, in the Moodle page, there's a, there's a block of Moodle that says, what should I know? Mm -hmm. Or something like that. I forgot the exact words, but anyway. So each week, like I'll put one up again for this week. Each week, I go through the lectures and I say, here are the topics that we've discussed. Mm -hmm. Now, we have been learning a lot of organic chemistry through uh, examples, societal examples. So, but those underlying chemical principles 
are important. So I'm not just going to ask you about ozone or coal or uh, hydrocarbon uh, burning. You know, I'm going to ask you some underlying chemistry concepts too. Things like polarity, electronegativity, which molecule is polar, which molecule is not polar. Why is a molecule polar? That's a great essay question. Maybe you should make yourself a little uh, cheat sheet. Why, why are molecules polar? Go back and read that lecture. Or why are they nonpolar? And what makes things polar and nonpolar? Okay, so there'll be a lot of those kinds of things, but I, I recommend you do both to prep for tests. Go through the what should I know lists and then also come to review session. That, okay, th well, those, those two will lead, I guarantee if you do those things, the exam day will be very stress-free for you mm -hmm. and, and you'll, be, you'll be very calm. Perfect. Thank you. And then I just had another quick question. If I know it's kind of hard to know right now, but if we tentatively are like staying online and we don't get to be in person before the exam, will we still have it in person or like at Delta or anything like that? So exams are always done in person. Okay. Just in so class. correct. Te tests, okay. tests are always done uh, in class. Um, or, or if you're a DSO student, you take it at DSO unless we've made arrangements. There's a few DSO students who've decided they'd rather just take it with, with everybody else. But yeah, so there will be three days where we absolutely will be in class together. Okay. Uh, I hate to say absolutely. You know, last, last summer I thought we were over at Delta was on the way out and then all of a sudden Omicron hit and then we got smacked. Now, will there be some other variant that I don't know about that will hit us and all of a sudden lock us down again? I tell you, I, I'm so jaded right now. I don't know if that's gonna happen or not. I hope not. Uh, it's looking like it won't, but I think for me, I, I don't ever wanna say never, never is never. So, but as it stands now, I'm hopeful we'll be in class together. Those who choose just to stay online you still will have to come in just those three days. Mm -hmm. Test one, test two, final exam. But if you wish to stay online, that's, all, that's okay too. It, hopefully you're able to get all this stuff. It's not too onerous and, and, and you'll be able to do fine throughout the class without having to come to class. Uh, but you know, if you can come to class, I'd certainly love to see you, okay? Perfect, thank you so much. Yep. I'm definitely ready to go back to class. I haven't been on campus at all this semester. My entire job is everyone's out sick and it's just been awful. There's like I'm with three you. of us. <laughs> it's just me and my wife right now. And thank God we really love each other because I think we'd probably kill each other. Um, I just had a quick question regarding the uh, anesthesia part of today. Sure. Um, so all of those compounds, we don't need to like, uh, or do we need to like memorize all of them? Oh, you don't memorize any, you, you do so little memorization. So the big okay. takeaway with anesthesia is that they are organohalogens. Not all of them, not all of them. Obviously ethyl alcohol didn't contain any carbon halogen bond, but a lot, a lot of these gaseous um, anesthesia agents do contain carbon fluorine, carbon chlorine, multiple carbon fluorine bonds, carbon chlorine bonds. So basically for the anesthesia stuff, what I want you to know is that there are many anesthesia gases that are organohalogens. Now, obviously nitrous oxide is not, right? N2O uh, from the dentist's office and and I hope none of you are doing stupid stuff, right? You know, the whippet nonsense, the, the, the whipping cream to make uh, cream for people are getting those little cartridges of nitrous oxide and sniffing them. That's stupid. Don't, don't do that. You know, you want to get a buzz, go out for a run. Don't, don't be inhaling, you know, freaking whipping cream whippets. That, that, that's... You're going to hurt yourself. So 
I've seen a lot of people, younger people get involved in this kind of nonsense. And, and I, I think, you know, you got to be careful with what you put in your body, you know, put only good stuff into your body. Um, I had a quick question about just the, what was it? Just the reactions and functional groups we're supposed to memorize. Like, do you have a specific outline for what we need to know about each thing? Yeah, it's on, it's online. So, you know, okay. that list of stuff where it says, uh -huh. what do I need to know? Yes, those, sir. Those, those, that, is, that is your list. That, that's okay. your list of stuff that you need to know. So if I say something like um, uh, chiral, right? It's not in your list yet. It will be chiral. So right next to chiral is handedness. So you just have to know chirality means handedness of molecules, just like chirality in your body, your, your, your left hand and your right hand. Uh, reactions. So what is an oxidation reaction, right? change in oxidation state, right? From general chemistry. You learned about yeah. redox chemistry. Again, a lot of stuff from general chemistry, I don't reteach here, but I'm sure most of you are quite familiar with what a redox reaction is. Changing oxidation state, right? So when I took carbon and I burned it, carbon's oxidation state is a zero, right? You don't have to know that, I would tell you. And carbon dioxide's oxidation state is a negative four. I mean, a positive four in the carbon state of carbon dioxide. So that is an oxidative process. Carbon went from a zero to a positive four oxidation state. Okay. Um, so that's just a normal kind of chemical bookkeeping. It's just accounting is what redox chemistry is. Uh, and we'll have more to say about that in review. And I'll give you some examples of some, well, you already know one big one, you know, the combustion reaction, that's a big one. Uh, you already know another one, and that is that hyd hydrogenation reaction in the Uri Miller bulb, where hydrogen gas added to the molecule. That's a reduction process. So. Thank you. You're welcome. Any of this? Okay, if not, I hope everybody has a good Thursday and a very good weekend. Uh, be safe. Um, there will be a homework posted tonight, by the way. I'll send every, an email, uh, but a homework that's going to be posted tonight, it will be due Sunday evening, okay, 10 p.m. Um, so be prepared for that. And don't forget about me, okay? Have hey, a good sorry, weekend. I just said something in oh. the chat. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I said something in the chat, but it wasn't answered. Um, are the, re the review sessions just like the classes before the exams, or is it a separate, like, office? No, it's just, just a class before the test. Okay. So okay. It's, a class that, it's a class that we won't do anything new. Okay. It'll just be kind of reviewing all the stuff we've done up until that point. Correct. So okay, you, just come to, you just come to class. So okay. you don't have to have, so yeah, a lot of people... I thought about like giving an evening review session or, uh, but you know, it doesn't work because then people say, oh, you know, I can't make that review session. You're being unfair because I have to work. And so giving review sessions outside of class time uh, leads to a lot of angst with a lot of students yeah. because let's face it, people have other activities that are not in class time. And so that gives sort of an unfair advantage to those who are unencumbered, that, that don't have to go to work or don't have to go to swim practice or don't have to, to go to uh, wherever other activity they're in, band. Uh, so that's why I give it in class time. Okay, great, thank you. Have a great okay. day. You too. Anybody else all right? Thank you. Okay, very good. Have a nice weekend, everybody. Bye-bye.